It was the Christmas of 2005. I was but a young lad of 13 and oh boy was I excited, oh god. Even though the Xbox 360 had come out in November, I still just had my PS2 and these were still the days when plenty of exciting new titles were being released for it. As a kid, I usually did pretty damn well on Christmas and my parents were extra generous this particular year, gifting me with a bunch of new PS2 games. I can't remember all of them, but I do remember getting The Simpsons Hit and Run and Fahrenheit, two games I had a massive amount of fun with back then, Hit and Run especially. However, there was a clear highlight within the range of fun new titles I got that year, and it was a game I'd been eagerly reading up on in the preceding months in gaming magazines, back when gaming mags were still a thing. And that game was Resident Evil 4 Live 5. No, I'm just joking, it was Resident Evil 4, and I'd even got this super cool steelbook version too, stoking my adolescent excitement even more. Actually, that sounds a bit weird. Sorry. To be honest, I'd never quite been a huge Resident Evil fan before getting the fourth game, but it was a series I'd certainly always liked and been both fascinated and intimidated by. In fact, while I'd spent a decent amount of time with Resident Evil 1, 2 and 3 on the PS1, I don't think I'd ever actually gotten remotely close to finishing any of them. I'd usually played through the first chunk, reach a point where I either got stuck on a puzzle or couldn't figure out where to go next, then just give up. But everything I'd been hearing and seeing about Resi 4 just compelled the hell out of me. The amazing graphics, the intense gore, terrifying villagers with bags over their heads armed with chainsaws, massive monsters, shotguns, magnums, rocket launchers, it all looks so freaking cool and I could not wait to play it. Of course, the game had already been out on the GameCube for a good 6 months by this point, but apart from the odd handheld console here and there, I've never actually owned a Nintendo console. Still haven't even played a Zelda game. The reason I'm giving all this personal backstory about my history with Resi 4 is just to let you know that I have a history with this game. So much so that I've beaten it more times than any other game, even Dark Souls or Bloodborne. Regardless of whatever new game came out on the PS2 or Xbox 360 or even the PS4 long afterwards, my comfort game was Resident Evil 4 because I knew with 100% certainty that I would always have a fantastically fun time with it, regardless of whether it was my 5th time playing through it or my 50th. I'm exaggerating a bit, I haven't actually beaten it 50 times, that'd be mental. Though the actual number might not be that far away from 30, which is also slightly mental. Resident Evil 4 received widespread critical and commercial acclaim upon release and quickly nailed its flag into the ground as an instant classic and a giant of the genre to influence many other games for years to come. The game wasn't just notable for its quality though because it also marked a profound shift for the franchise as it moved away from its classical survival horror roots in favour of a much more action oriented experience, ditching the fixed camera angles pre-rendered backgrounds and ammo scarcity to a third person camera view, fully 3D environments and a focus on all out action, encouraging the mowing down and blowing away of hordes of enemies in every area instead of the more careful and considered approaches to offence which were encouraged in the earlier titles. Hell, even the enemy of choice was a wee bit controversial, cause gone were your conventional zombies as inflicted with the T or G virus, having been replaced with ganados the victims of a parasite known as the Last Plagueis, and so whilst the older titles put you against flesh hungry walking corpses, eager for a bite of Jill Valentine's big delicious arm, now we have villagers, cultists and soldiers going about their business, even communicating and coexisting, albeit to morbid and malevolent ends. The changes were certainly not well received by all though, with some folk even refusing to play the game in protest over its role in the change in the series trajectory and it can't be denied that the series did very much change after Resi 4, becoming increasingly action oriented with the fifth instalment, then even more so with the coming of Resident Evil 6, a game I've still never actually played though maybe I'll get around to it one of these days. Though I absolutely loved Resident Evil 7, and as for Resident Evil 8, it was decent enough. Speaking of sequels and offshoots, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the RE4 remake which came out earlier in the year, and though my discussion of that particular game will be pretty minimal throughout this video, because it's simply a different game after all, I did actually like the remake quite a bit. 
I was one of those who initially thought the idea of a remake was ridiculous when rumours of it first started circulating a few years back, but despite that, I picked it up when it came out, just like nearly every other angry dog who insists that they're not going to buy something. To tell you the truth, I was actually blown away by the remake at first, though that red hot enjoyment did gradually cool throughout the later portion of the game. All in all though, the remake was a great game, but it was also a different game, with a different feel, and so for this video, I'm going to focus purely on the OG, the big cheese. As for what to expect from the structure of this video, I'll be covering Leon's journey from beginning to end, discussing the story, levels, enemies, bosses and more, and I'll also provide explanation and analysis of various gameplay elements and mechanics along the way. Regarding the story, I'll be covering it as if the remake didn't exist, and so any narrative changes found in the remake are irrelevant for the purposes of this video. Also, I've got to give a shout out to a fantastic game facts resource I used a bunch for this video, put together by a user called Cheese It. It contains loads of interesting and in-depth details on all sorts of background stats and modifiers, which are largely undetectable through a regular playthrough, and so I'd encourage anyone interested to take a look at his findings by using the link in the description. Lastly, before I get on with it, if you enjoyed the video, why not drop a like? And if you really like it and want to stick around for more fun retrospectives on great games, maybe you can even subscribe to the channel. I'd sure appreciate it. Also, big thank you to my kind patrons for your support. I really appreciate it, bros. And with all that being said, let's talk Resident Evil 4. So I'll first provide the setup to the story and the early events of the game before discussing everything in more detail. Resident Evil 4 begins six years after the G-Virus epidemic which brought Raccoon City to its knees. Of course, the hero of Raccoon City as depicted in Resident Evil 2 was Leon S. Kennedy, a then rookie cop thrust into a world of chaos and death, braving zombies, liquors and a variety of other mutated monstrosities before making his dramatic escape. Six years have passed since then though, and Leon is now a highly trained agent working for the US government, and on a special mission no less, that being to rescue the President's daughter. Ashley Graham, a 20 year old woman kidnapped on her way home from university. Although the identity of the kidnapper is unknown, it was suspected to be someone on the inside, or at least some specialist with knowledge of the inner workings of the government. Thus, Leon has been sent all the way out to sunny Spain to investigate a possible sighting of the president's daughter, with him being one of the few completely trustworthy agents left. I guess this is the rationale for why he's been sent here on a solo mission though it's kind of a weak one. I mean, he is accompanied by a pair of Spanish police officers, but in the long run they don't turn out to be a massive help. I'm still glad they're here though, because we do get this wee gem of an optional cutscene. Huh. Forget your makeup or something? Leon does have a bit of backup in the form of Ingrid Honigan though, a support agent who'll provide Leon with intel on the mission from time to time. After progressing just a bit further through the village outskirts, Leon barges straight into the first home he sees, attempting to speak to this random Spanish peasant, in English too, before being told to fuck off. That's not even a joke by the way, the actual translation of what the dude says is, what the hell are you doing here, get out motherfucker. Then, the villager attacks Leon with an axe, not entirely unreasonable considering an armed man has just invaded his property, where Leon kills him with a gun. From here, more villagers, or ganados as they're called in-game, which translates to cattle, swarm the home, also attacking Leon. Furthermore, the bridge where we just entered from is destroyed, and the police vehicle is now a fiery wreck, having been pushed or driven into the raging river below, though our two cop buddies are nowhere to be seen. Thus, with his escape route cut off and an important mission still to fulfil, all that's left for Leon to do is carry on through the outskirts, encountering more frenzied ganados along the way, and following old wooden signposts to the village. From a vantage point behind a tree, Leon sees the villagers simply going about their farm work, with the men pushing around wheelbarrows while the women carry around buckets of water, all while the eyeless corpse of one of the policemen burns upon a pyre of hay, impaled upon an enormous hook tied to a wooden stake. Before this, it was clear that there was something very wrong with this remote place, 
but the nonchalant way everyone goes about their business just minutes after committing a brutal murder really starts to hammer home that this is not a regular village, and these are not regular villagers, and these are not regular chickens, and this is not my beautiful wife. Although Leon initially remains undetected upon entering the village, it's not long before all hell breaks loose and the entire village descends into complete violence, with every man, woman, doctor and cow focused on chasing down and butchering the Un forastero! with forastero translating to stranger, and it certainly won't be the last time Leon gets called a stranger. The assault is absolutely relentless, with more and more frenzied ganados pouring forth from every visible hovel before eventually a distant church bell is heard and the violence stops, with the villagers dropping their weapons and heading into the insignia marked door, leaving Leon completely and suddenly alone, and concluding one of the most terrifying, challenging and memorable introductions to any game. RE4's story is largely pretty straightforward from beginning to end. Of course, the situation does deepen as the true scale of the threat is revealed and as additional characters from Leon's past become involved, but throughout the whole game, the mission is to save the President's daughter and take out anyone or anything standing in the way. Tonally, RE4 can be a bit all over the place, but really not in a bad way. There is a lot of cheesy dialogue, and the villains in particular can be very over the top and even wacky, but there are serious elements too. Not quite so much throughout the actual story, but certainly while traversing through levels. For example, in a cabin very early on when we're still on the way to the village, you're greeted with this sight. Dude, that's fucking crazy. That is a hardcore image. Same with the sight of the policeman just afterwards. But then, even as you're seeing stuff like this, if you look down below at Leon's thoughts on the matter, you'll see baffling insights such as, guess there's no sex discrimination here. Well, that's a hell of a takeaway. Speaking of Leon's character, he's a bit of a dork, but I like it that way. I don't get the feeling that this was intentional either, because I think you're supposed to think he's really witty and cool, but he comes away with the lamest remarks and retorts, such as Insects' life doesn't compare to human lives. I was starting to get worried. Don't you mean lonely? I really don't give a damn. Rain or shine, you're going down. Sadler, you're small time. <laughs> The environments and such really can get quite grim and oppressive at times, and even frightening. But in general, the game doesn't take itself too seriously, with even the more serious moments usually being undercut, or should I perhaps say, complemented by some element of silliness. The whole opening is superbly done, and despite occurring just 15 or so minutes into the game, the village holdout is one of its hardest sections, and almost guaranteed to cause a few bewildered deaths to any new player before they eventually get through it, especially by good old Dr Salvador, the very enemy whose unnerving silhouette was shown on the box art of the standard edition on PS2. Capcom were clearly very keen on this trial by fire manner of intro too, because they did much the same thing in the opening for RE5 then did the exact same thing in RE8, though I really wasn't a fan of how they did it in the latter case. The holdout can be pretty damn challenging in RE4, but for RE8 I found it to be way too difficult, with almost everything which came afterwards feeling way too easy in comparison. Bit of an odd design decision, but let's not get too off topic. There are of course two ways to end the village holdout, those being to either take out 12 ganados in total, or 15 if you initiate the optional cutscene in the house, or simply wait around for either 6.5 or 7.5 minutes, again depending on the optional triggering of said cutscene. I mean, I say simply wait around, but that's easier said than done when the entire area is crawling with filthy peasants. Though there are strategies to achieve this if you really want to save your ammo, like repeatedly climbing up and then jumping down from the tower, so staying up there for too long will of course trigger a firebombing from frustrated villagers who are sick of your cowardly tactics. Also, I know I said I wasn't really going to talk about the remake, but it did make me laugh when I climbed up the tower in that game expecting the usual retaliatory firebomb from below, only for the floor to collapse instead. Very nicely done. Speaking of evasion tactics, the player's best friend in RE4 is invincibility frames, and to that point, I don't think I've ever played a game that's as generous with the iframes as this one. Hey, look over there, there's a Dr Salvador. He has a bag over his head and everything, it's kind of fucking terrifying, I must evade him. Well, short of blasting him with a shotgun, you could always back away or turn around and sprint to clear some distance, or you could, you know, hop over a fence right as he's swinging his rusty chainsaw across your neck. Or why not climb a ladder, perfect time to climb a ladder. 
or going for a roundhouse kick on a nearby Ganado. These seem like quirky little exploits to throw in situationally every now and then, but really, they are core parts of re Force combat. It's a guaranteed way to survive literally any attack. And there are opportunities for invincibility animations nearly anywhere, including in boss fights. Is it dumb as hell that you can avoid damage this way? And does it make sense? The answers are yes and no, respectively. But nonetheless, quirks like this play a large part in giving RE4's gameplay its own distinctive feel and fun identity. The entire village portion of the game, which makes up roughly a third of its runtime, is very strong in general, remaining highly enjoyable to explore and play through even after the frantic intensity of the holdout, and an element which certainly contributes to this is believability. After the village, we come to the farm section, and again, you can see and hear Ganados toiling away and communicating to one another, though conditions are absolutely miserable wherever you roam, and there's a big focus on visceral disgust. As well as the rancid squalor the villagers are living in, not to mention how sparsely furnished their living quarters are, even the water they drink from is filthy and stinking, and the less said about the toilet, the better. Fun wee detail about this toilet later on by the way, although there's a male Ganado in here in the main campaign with Leon, if you enter as Ada in separate ways, there's a female there instead. Isn't that interesting? Back to the farm though, for whatever reason I locked out with the chickens and they started rapidly shitting out eggs here from their arse. I usually only find one in this area, but I found three on this playthrough, pretty sweet. Also I saw this dog running around in the farm here but I don't remember ever seeing it before on previous playthroughs. And although you might assume it's the same dog slash wolf as the one you can free from the bear trap back near the start, it's not. It's actually a totally different colour, which is a little bit perplexing. This dog in general is a strange inclusion, especially when it does this. There used to be a cool wee glitch which could be performed in the farm by going up to this part of the fence and vaulting over it at a precise angle, allowing you to clip out of bounds and then collect a bunch of random items and weapons and such, stored out of reach, but sadly it can't be done on the HD versions of the game on the PS4 or Steam, apparently due to those versions running at 60fps or something. Though I do remember a buddy of mine coming over to my house as a kid and showing me how to do it, back in the days when rumours of cool glitches and cheats was spread by word of mouth in schools rather than on the internet. I still remember a pal writing down the cheat code to spawn the jetpack in GTA San Andreas and me thinking he was completely full of shit. And then I tried it and it actually worked. But I'm getting off topic, again. Just for clarity, all the footage shown here was on professional difficulty and despite how many times I've beaten the game, believe it or not, this was somehow the first time I've ever beaten it on full difficulty. In fact, when I first played the game as a lad, I exclusively played on easy before later realising that certain rooms and sections of the game are inaccessible unless playing on normal or above, like the hedge maze and the queen's grail room in the castle. Difficulty is really not a straightforward affair with RE4, because while you can choose your preferred level at the start, there's also difficulty adjustment to contend with. Difficulty adjustment, or DA for short, is a dynamic difficulty modifier constantly working in the background and shifting from rank 1 at the easiest all the way to rank 10 at the hardest, with things like taking damage, missing shots and dying causing it to adjust downwards to make the game a bit easier whilst performing well in combat slides it higher. And the ways in which the differences in difficulty rank actually manifest themselves can be quite interesting, like modifying enemy health and damage but even going so far as to affect enemy behaviour and numbers. It's kind of like the way difficulty is dynamically adjusted via your actions in Demon's Souls, though as esoteric as World Tendency was in that game, it was still more explicit than the DA system in RE4, which isn't referenced at all in the game and which you could easily never realise is even a thing. In fact, I only learned about DA when watching a speedrun of the Resident Evil 3 remake a couple of years ago because it became a staple of all RE games after its first appearance in the fourth entry. Despite all this, the difficulty level chosen at the start still very much matters, because the only setting which allows you to experience the entire spectrum of difficulty from ranks 1 to ranks 10 in the one playthrough is normal, with easy mode never getting harder than rank 5, and pro mode being locked at rank 10, which is what I was playing on here, which to be honest turned out to be not quite as hard as I thought, though I'll admit some later sections of the island definitely gave me a run for my money. 
Resident Evil 4 did of course come out in 2005, but when QTEs were still all the rage, and indeed they make plenty of appearances in this game, though the first is merely a single button mashing session as the game goes full cartoon mode with Leon being chased by a massive boulder. I'd only attempted pro mode just the once before this playthrough, many years ago, but I distinctly remember dying repeatedly here as I just could not tap that fucking X button fast enough. Because yeah, the various button mash and stick wiggle requirements do increase with the higher difficulty ranks, making it that much harder to escape from damage when grabbed by a Ganado, Nevistador or... <laughs> Though, just as with the fence glitch from the farm, I believe the difficulty of the button mash for the boulder here or the Salazar statue later on was made more difficult than intended, again due to some FPS nonsense that I don't really understand. And saying that though, I had no difficulty at all with these sections on this playthrough, so not sure if the game was patched or if I just got significantly better at button mashing over the years at the expense of any other desirable attributes in life, such as having a family or well-paying job. Though most of the Ganados thus far have been armed with somewhat traditional farm equipment like pitchforks and hatchets, as well as knives and a bloody chainsaw. Further on we get our first taste of dynamite, though you still do have to contend with ranged offence beforehand when enemies throw their hatchet at you, and ranged attacks only become more difficult to deal with as the game progresses. The accuracy of thrown hatchets are also an element affected by DA, because sometimes you'll get lucky and they'll completely miss, whereas other times they're thrown exactly on target, requiring a well aimed shot before they meet their target. One enemy on its own chucking a hatchet your way is really too difficult to deal with, unless it's thrown from off camera. But the real challenge is when you've got several Ganados converging on you at once, all with different weapons and attacks, and all of a sudden that hatchet hurtling towards Leon's dumb face isn't so easy to casually swat out of the air with the knife. Seriously though, it feels great shooting an incoming projectile, and if you're really brave, you can even deflect them with the knife or even a well-timed explosion. Speaking of projectiles and explosions, Back to the dynamite. Again, not too tricky to deal with on its own, but even a couple of Ganados chucking dynamite your way can get very dangerous, and explosions are one of the most high damaging forces in RE4, but that applies to both Leon and the enemies, and indeed, just as hatchets can be shot out of the air, so can dynamite. And you can even blow them up while they're still holding on to it, as expertly demonstrated in the following clip. Yeah, I'm not great. Here's what it's supposed to look like when you don't suck. As miserable and hostile as both the village and the situation are, thankfully it's not long before we see a friendly face in the form of Luis Serra, bound and gagged within a closet, though right after introductions are made, the towering form of Chief Mendez intervenes, or should I say, the big cheese. The period where Leon is knocked out here is very significant for the rest of the story, because this is where the main antagonist of the game is introduced, Lord Sadler, or should I say, the big cheese. No, that's a different guy. He injects Leon with a dose of the Las Plagas, the exact same parasitic organism afflicting all the villagers, and Chief Mendez who we just saw, and pretty much every single enemy in the game, actually. And this of course has ramifications for Leon throughout the game as he slowly loses his grip on himself. Leon being infected with the Las Plagas does add a wee bit of confusion to the story though, because the game can't seem to decide whether the antagonists want Leon alive or dead. Sadler or Mendez had the perfect opportunity to take him out here, but instead they just let him live to roam free and fuck shit up afterwards while the parasite matures inside his body. There are also several times afterwards where they have a chance to kill him, but don't. Yet every single Ganado in the game wants Leon dead on sight, including in the very next cutscene. Yet from the reaction of the villagers to the church bell at the end of the village holdout, we know that Sadler holds near absolute control over the Ganados, so it's all a little bit sloppy. But to be honest, if you come to a story like this wanting to find plot holes and inconsistencies, yeah, you're going to find them. But at the same time, I don't really give a fuck. It's a bit of fun for God's sake. It's difficult for me to take anything in this game all that seriously after seeing Leon run from a boulder. By the way, quick note about the QTEs like this one with the axe dragon Ganado. There are only ever two possible inputs for any event, 
either X plus square or L2 and R2. But did you know that even if you press all four possible buttons, you'll nail every single such QTE? I mean, they're not very difficult to react to in the first place, but yeah, you can just press everything and it will work. Regarding Lewis, he's a really enjoyable character, and his introduction and laid-back personality can be very welcoming and refreshing after the relentless hostility of the villagers beforehand, though there's certainly more to him than at first glance. For example, he mentions to Leon here that he was a cop in Madrid, but based on what we later learn about his past, this is most likely not true at all. Though you'll most certainly grow to like him as a character, his backstory and association with the Last Plagueis are fleshed out much more in the files you pick up and can read, and in the Separate Ways campaign. After nailing the QTE and watching Lewis skedaddle, we encounter one of the most iconic video game characters of all time, The Merchant. Got something that might interest you. <laughs> Although I'm sure it's common knowledge by now, for anyone not aware, both Leon and The Merchant were voiced by the same dude. I actually only learned this myself earlier this year, because it's one of those things you don't notice until someone points it out, and then you can hear the similarity. It's like when you realise that both Patches and Lawtrek from Dark Souls 1 are voiced by the same guy. Same with Waka from FF10, and Marcus Phoenix from Gears of War. The Merchant really does play a big role in this game's personality, though as iconic as his appearance and voice absolutely are, his function is just as important, with RE4 being the first game in the series to have its own currency, allowing for the purchasing of new weapons which can even be upgraded. Of course, most enemy kills reward you with a piece of sweet loot, usually either ammo or money, though an aspect of the game's economy that I quickly fell in love with and still love today is the inclusion of treasures especially the ones with empty sockets to be filled in with precious gems, like the Elegant Mask, Beerstein, Butterfly Lamp, or Golden Lynx. There's something so satisfying about finally completing a treasure set, especially because certain gem components can be very well hidden, as in, contained within an easily missable bird's nest, or stuck to a random wall hidden. In saying that, you can purchase treasure maps from the merchant to reveal the location of all treasures for that level, but for whatever reason, I just never did that as a teenager, and so it was rare that I ever managed to actually finish a set. I think it took years before I even found the location of the beer stein in the farm, or the antique pipe from the swamp section. Anyone else think these objects just look really aesthetically pleasing too? I love how shiny they are, and how they spin around. It makes me excited to take them back to the merchant to see how much they're worth. There are also the somewhat less exciting treasures, like the Spinals and the Velvet Blues, which are dotted around the world in far greater number, though it is still nice when you collect a decent hoard of them to sell off. By the way, even though it's really not a gem you tend to hear about outside of RE4, Spinals are an actual type of gemstone, and they look like this. As for Velvet Blues, that seems to be a made-up term, though it does resemble Amethyst, and I actually have some Amethyst, sitting right next to my collection of beer steins. Why am I talking like this? You can buy a rifle from the merchant at this point, but personally I always hold off on this for now, because a, in my opinion, much better rifle is available a bit later on once you make it to the castle. Instead, I picked up one of the best weapons for pro difficulty, the TMP, or Tactical Machine Pistol. I think a lot of folks sleep on this weapon for whatever reason, but they shouldn't, because while it's extremely fun and cathartic to just lay into a tight group of ganados with some concentrated automatic fire, its true ability lies in its ability to stun. See, excluding RE4's mini-boss type enemies, like the Dr. Salvadors, Garadors, JJs and Regenerators, it's really, really easy to stun shit. As in, nearly any enemy attack can be completely halted in its tracks with a single shot anywhere on the body with any weapon, including the TMP and even the knife. This makes it super handy for interrupting enemy attacks, but even more importantly than that, just a single bullet to the head will open them up for a follow-up kick, so that's extra damage to the stunned enemy, plus any other ganado in the way, and furthermore, regular kicks, back kicks and suplexes all have inherent crit chance, hence why it's not uncommon to obliterate enemy heads with the kicks, though this can only happen if the kick actually connects with the enemy's head. And let's also not forget that Leon has complete invulnerability when kicking. The potential for just one TMP bullet to allow for so much follow-up damage from kicks and knife slashes on downed enemies makes it an absolute beast when working through pro difficulty, because ammo is that bit more scarce here, so you've got to use whatever tools you can. 
There's a good deal more progressing through the various zones of the village and through the valley area which was actually really tough on throw mode and on into the warehouse with even more dynamite, as well as bear traps. I love the inclusion of traps in general because it means that even if no ganados are in sight you've got to stay vigilant for other hazards, though the traps do become quite a bit more blatant later on in the castle. By the way, how fucking great does it feel to do this? There's nothing quite like using an enemy's own weapon against them and taking out several of them all at once and again, moments like this feel extra rewarding on pro mode because of all the ammo saved and grief averted. Because bear in mind that your health bar can easily go from full to nearly empty with a single explosion. Mind you, any damage taken in the warehouse can be rather unconventionally undone directly after by knifing a few bass to death and then eating them raw. Mmm, bass. The destination, however, is the residence of Chief Mendez, though unfortunately it's rendered utterly inaccessible without first solving an extremely complex puzzle. Yeah, Ari Force puzzles are without fail laughably easy. In fact, I'm pretty sure this puzzle can actually be solved in just two moves. I somehow managed to fuck it up a bit here and make it harder on myself. With this being the house of the Big Chief, as you might expect, he's actually home. And again, despite having the perfect opportunity to take Leon out here, he lets him live due to the presence of the last Plagueis in his blood, as indicated by his red eyes here. If you look at the eyes of Mendes himself, you'll notice that he has two different coloured eyes, though this attribute makes more sense later on. There's an optional cutscene here too if you choose to follow Mendes through the door he exits through, and though it is easily missable, it technically is canon as revealed when playing as Ada in separate ways though her identity isn't yet revealed at this point, as you just get a glimpse of her signature red dress, tits, legs and ass. The actual residence of Mendes is surprisingly distinctive, being far more well furnished and pleasant than the hovels seen in the village. And this is where you start to realise that there's a degree of variability with how the Las Plagas affects different people, both their mental and physical characteristics. The real prize found within the house is the insignia key, required to open up the door back in the main village, the one which all the ganados passed through when the church bell sounded back at the start, leading on to one of the most atmospheric areas in the game, the graveyard. Situated directly in front of the church, which looks rather ordinary from the outside except for the strange symbol on top in place of a crucifix. There's another wee puzzle in this area, though it is an optional one. For years I knew the solution to it, but didn't know why it was the solution, because in the Steel Book edition of RE4 there was a wee starter guide which just told you the correct inputs, that being 3334443, and I just always had this memorised afterwards. I think this playthrough is the first time I've ever actually solved the puzzle conventionally, and all you need to do is look at the emblems on the three gravestones of twins and make sure only those are lit up. It doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense there's a random green cat's eye locked away in here, but as with several aspects of the game, it gets explained later in separate ways. Unfortunately, the church is locked, and so the only path forward is the scenic route, as Honigan puts it, across a treacherous wooden walkway hanging over the dark waters of a strange lake, and on through a swamp which is actually rigged with explosives and fucking crawling with the ganados. Holy shit, I was not prepared for how many enemies the game throws at you here on pro mode, not to mention snakes. Though you know you've reached peak skill level in RE4 when you remember exactly which boxes the snakes are hidden in and know to follow up the first knife slash with a second, being rewarded with a chicken egg for some reason. On the subject of wildlife, just before the swamp area there's a big group of crows sitting round and while I mentioned how satisfying it is to unload on ganados with a full clip from a TMP, that's nothing compared to how satisfying doing this is. All that treasure, all that loot, and you even get another flash grenade, I love it. Up ahead we finally see the fate of the other policeman. Of course, one was burnt alive back in the village, but we see the other being tossed into the lake only to be swallowed whole by an enormous amphibian looking thing known as Del Lagos, Spanish for of the lake or from the lake. I do apologise if any of the translations I provide here are just wrong. By the way, I don't actually speak a lick of Spanish and you get varying results from Google Translate. For example, apparently Las Plagas means the plague, as you'd expect, but Google Translate says it means the pests, and then Garador is supposed to mean the claw, or the claw. Yet, here's what you get if you put that into Google Translate, so I don't fucking know. I'm just a small man from Scotland, what do you want from me? There's even some fish swimming around in the lake itself, 
which you can shoot and then pick up afterwards for some health items. Del Lagos is in fact the first boss in the game, though I guess it plays out more like a deadly minigame than a conventional boss fight with guns and grenades, and you can't even heal up during the fight. On pro difficulty, you're only allowed to get chucked off the boat one time here, because if it happens a second time... Del Lagos takes just 10 hits with the harpoon on normal, but 13 on pro, though it doesn't actually matter where on its body you hit it, it'll do the same damage regardless. For whatever reason, I seem to have a false memory in my mind regarding a specific aspect of this boss fight, specifically the part where Del Lagos submerges and you need to wait for it to re-emerge and hit it at least once to make it divert before hitting the boat. There are these frantic red arrows which appear to guide you on where the boss is going to attack from, but I seem to remember these arrows not appearing on pro mode, but I guess they just do, unless it was something they added to the HD version, though more realistically I'm probably just remembering it wrong. After nailing Del Lagos and making it across the lake, Leon passes out in a nearby cabin in a fit of intense pain brought on by the last Plagueis parasite working its way around his organs and nervous system, and upon waking back up, it's now night time, and things have suddenly gotten a lot more dangerous out there. It's not long at all before we are introduced to the very first visible parasite, brutally bursting out from the head of a ganado, though this is the one and only time you ever see one emerge in this manner, always requiring a certain amount of damage being dealt beforehand in all other occasions. And thus, just as you're getting comfortable with popping heads off with the pistol, shotgun, rifle and TMP, now there are these sickening alien growths to contend with. Now, any time you blow a head off, you have to anxiously wait a couple of seconds to see whether they're going to slump down to the ground dead or whether one of these things are going to pop out their neck, because they are both tanky and deadly, and they function independently of the host they've sprouted from. And so even if the ganado they're attached to is in the middle of an animation like climbing a ladder or even mid stagger, the bladed parasite is constantly whipping back and forth. Of course, flash grenades aren't just for killing innocent birds, but are also the main weakness of the Last Plagueis, killing them outright, and this is huge, not to mention a wee bit hidden. As far as I know, there's no dialogue or file in the game suggesting that flash grenades work like this, so I imagine most first time players probably discover this hidden effect by accident, if at all. On my first playthrough I just sold all my flash grenades, because they seemed lame, I wanted the explosive ones. The second best way to take out a Las Plagas, however, is with a rifle, doing a guaranteed critical hit for 10 times normal damage, but his rifle shots to the head of untransformed enemies are also guaranteed crits, dealing 20 times normal damage, basically a guaranteed kill, though these damage bonuses are restricted to your regular Ganado type enemies, and don't apply to many bosses. Before realising how effective rifles were for the parasites, I'd usually try and take them out with a shotgun, but I always found this to be really variable in effectiveness, sometimes obliterating them with a single shot, but other times taking 3 or 4, and the main variable here really is whether or not you're getting a critical hit. There are all sorts of hidden damage and crit modifiers working in the background depending on what enemy you're hitting, where you hit them, and with what type of weapon. Of course, some stats are visible, like when you're upgrading firepower, firing speed, reload speed and capacity, but this really is just the tip of the iceberg, there's a lot more to it. Further on through the dark rainy night, we get an important item in the form of the round insignia, essentially being required to gain entry into the church, but of course on the way back there's another boss, El Gigante. We passed through this area just a bit earlier, and in fact this is where I killed all those birds, and furthermore, El Gigante was here that whole time as indicated by the ominous growling coming from behind this big door. But now that it's the dead of night, we actually have to face the creature. Do bear in mind too, that for as monstrous as the creature is, it was once a human, only growing to such a size because of the last Plagueis infection. El Gigante is of course the first regular boss in the game, though it's far from unique. In fact, you can fight as many as four of these things throughout one playthrough, and then an additional one in separate ways. The first one is a bit special because of the help provided by our wolf friend, El Lobos. Unless you were a heartless bastard and didn't free it from the bear trap back at the beginning. Although its main body must be pummeled with all available weaponry, the real enemy here is the giant parasite in its back 
controlling the larger entity, only appearing after enough damage is dealt, and unless you deal direct damage to the parasite in particular, it's possible to use up all your ammo on this fight and just never win, because the body will always just regenerate its HP back every time after recovering from getting staggered. Of course, you could just use a rocket launcher and kill it in one hit, but of all the bosses in the game, the El Gigante is not one you have to cheese in this manner, even on professional difficulty. The rocket launcher is a very unusual feature though, it must be said. A one hit KO on almost any enemy or boss in the game, and purchasable for just 30,000 pesetas from any merchant, and you can even buy more in subsequent areas. Furthermore, if you beat the game on normal mode, you can buy an infinite rocket launcher for 1 million pesetas for New Game Plus, though for as fun as that sounds, as near anyone who has actually tried it will attest, it gets boring really, really quickly. One of the many things RE4 does very well is rewarding the player handsomely after bosses, giving you fat stacks of pesetas, and the amount you get increases with the more difficult bosses too, but I just love how towering and extravagant the blue ring is after beating a boss. It does a great job in making you excited to pick it up, so as to make your weapons stronger to take down even bigger bosses later on. Back at the church which is now accessible with a round insignia, we see its interior again adorned with that odd insignia also found on top of the church, and on the insignia key from earlier on, and pretty much everywhere else in the game too, and indeed this is the symbol of the cult known as the Los Illuminados, which translates to the Enlightened Ones. After another simple and short, yet still fun and memorable puzzle, Leon finally reaches his mission target, Ashley Graham, with her weird face. I do like Ashley's character in this game, not that there's all that much character development to be honest, but her design was always a bit odd, and I actually really liked her redesign and voice acting in the remake. Nonetheless, we're stuck with her now, but not before another encounter with the leader of the Lost Illuminados, Lord Sadler, the same person who injected Leon with the last Plagueis while he was knocked out earlier. It's revealed here that the cult had Ashley kidnapped so as to infect her with the last Plagueis before sending her back to the president in exchange for a hefty ransom, while remaining in near complete control of her via the parasite in her body. Thus, both Leon and Ashley are in the process of being transformed into Ganados, puppets for Sadler to control, meaning that a simple escape is no longer an option, with the need for a cure being a far more pressing concern before the last Plagueis parasites fully and irreversibly mature inside their bodies. And yet again, we have another occasion where Sadler explains exactly why he wants to keep both Ashley and Leon alive before having two Ganados try to kill them with crossbows immediately afterwards as he leaps through the window. Does he want them alive or not? And now, for a little while at least, the game turns into a bit of an escort mission as we lead Ashley all the way back through the village and farm area, now even darker, rainier and more treacherous than before. Another cool touch here is that now the Ganado's eyes glow red in the dark, a feature also shared by the merchant, interestingly enough, adding that extra bit of intrigue and mystery to the already enigmatic arms dealer. Escort missions have long had a pretty negative reputation in games, much like swimming sections, because all of a sudden your success as a player is now contingent on an additional factor partially beyond your control. Before this, any time you take damage or die, it's because your character who you are directly controlling got hit. And so for as frustrating as it may be to lose health, it's entirely on you. Whereas now, you could be playing like a damn pro, dodging hatchets, shooting the dynamite out of enemies' hands, and kicking everyone's fucking heads off, but that doesn't mean a damn thing if you take your eye off this separate moving entity who is even more vulnerable than you, especially when it comes to traps or explosions. In practice though, I never dread the escort sections of RE4, and to be honest, I don't even dislike them any more than any other section of the game, because although there are only two simple commands you can give to Ashley, these really go a long way towards controlling her whereabouts, and furthermore, in some particularly dangerous areas, you can even order her into a dumpster, where she's both invisible and invincible to enemies. Of course, that's not to say that the game doesn't get harder when Ashley's around, because it definitely does, especially in a few later sections, but it's not bullshit difficulty, it's just increased difficulty. It's another element you need to keep your eye on. Mind you, more often than not when Ashley gets hit, it's from an attack aimed at you with enemies preferring to pick her up and carry her out the nearest door, resulting in an instant game over. 
though at least when this happens it can be easily interrupted with a single hit. Though as ever in this game, that can be easier said than done when you've got your own horde of frenzied ganados to deal with right in front of you. Also, there are certain enemies who can't pick up Ashley at all, like the shield wielding cultists in the castle. And thus, the conclusion of my thesis is that the Ashway sections are all right with me, though it's also undeniable that she can be very irritating. Leon, For anyone who thinks I'm praising the game too much and you're know, sucking its dick, yes, I am doing that. I love this fucking game, okay? It was around about here that I purchased a new handgun for myself. Of course, the handgun you start out with is a handgun, but there are others, namely the Blacktail, Punisher, Red 9 and then the Burst Fire Matilda unlocked after beating the game. Objectively, the best handgun in terms of raw firepower is the Red 9, with the Blacktail coming in second, particularly when these guns are fully upgraded. In fact, a fully upgraded Red 9 is more powerful even than a decently upgraded regular shotgun, minus the knockback effect of course. That said, every weapon in this game is viable, and you can absolutely go from start to finish with a starting handgun and shotgun, as long as you're investing in upgrades, but still, there are some clearly superior weapons from each category. Speaking of the Red 9, we are not the only ones who favour it, because within a secluded cabin which Leon and Ashley run to, whilst being pursued by a fearsome mob of torch-wielding ganados, awaits Luis Serra, also armed with a Red 9, and in fact, the firepower stat of Luis's weapon in this section is entirely dependent on how upgraded your currently equipped weapon's firepower is, and if you switch from one weapon to a less or more upgraded weapon, Luis's damage will also adjust there and then. The Cabin Siege is one of many iconic moments in RE4, not least of all because of how damn difficult it can be. In fact, it's like a more intense and constricted version of the village holdout back at the beginning, to the extent that it also only ends when either enough time has passed, 5 minutes to be precise, or when 40 Ganados have been defeated. If Capcom wanted to be really nasty here, they would have had Ashway roaming around too, but thankfully she's hidden away in a cupboard, and Luis is also invincible, though he will turn on Leon if you shoot him enough. Adios, Leon. Afterwards, there's a couple of different routes to take, either the left path or the right. While a nearby file does detail the defence measures which have been put in place at each route, it does not specify which path leads to which specific defence measure, and nor could I remember. So uh, I just went with the right hand path. Let me just say that the whole file situation is ridiculous in RE4, and is the dumbest aspect of its plot delivery. As with nearly every RE game, you'll find files throughout the various levels, except here they were often written by the enemy, containing details on the specific plans they've put in place to stop Leon. So why the fuck are they just leaving all these notes around for Leon to find? Sometimes the notes will be lying nearby the merchant, so maybe a subtle explanation is that the merchant is collecting this intel for Leon to read, but really I think the most likely explanation is that there is no explanation and that it's dumb. I actually lucked out by choosing the right hand path here, because it was the one with another El Gigante, with identical stats to the one from before, the arena for this one is certainly more distinct. In fact, I believe you can even avoid the fight completely by running through the area and using the nearby old key on the door, except there's really no reason to do that at this point. We just fought an El Gigante earlier, and so it's hardly some insurmountable challenge, even with the presence of Ashley. Though fun fact about the two boulders you can send crashing down onto the boss here, they do literally no damage to it whatsoever. And not only that, but the boss is also completely invincible while stunned from them. I think the boulders were just put here so you can slow the boss down and then escape, but again, why would you want to escape at this stage? If you take the left hand path instead of the right, you've got to fight through an insane number of Ganados, including a new chainsaw variant which doesn't actually appear anywhere else in the base game the Bella sisters. I really like how these enemies have these rather innocent sounding names, it just makes them more interesting, like they have some dark, ambiguous backstory, especially Dr Salvador, who I'm pretty sure is violating the Hippocratic Oath here. Beyond the path stands a strange locked door, though instead of a conventional lock there's a retinal scanner here, quite an interesting technological feature considering how antiquated nearly everything else is. 
and just as a lock demands a key, while a retinal scanner demands an eye. Cast your mind back to the miscoloured left eye of Chief Mendes, and indeed, just past the really fun lift section, Leon enters a barn, leaving Ashray outside, sensing danger. And danger is correct, because we get our next major boss fight with Chief Mendes, after another dumb but fun QTE and cutscene. Now, there are certain boss fights in RE4 where if you know the enemy's weakness, the fight can be completely trivialised, and this is one of those fights. Though you can start blasting away at the Chief, particularly in his exposed spine, which takes double damage, the real strat is to use incendiary grenades, with just two taking him into a second phase, with another two ending the fight entirely, even on pro difficulty, saving you a fuck ton of ammo, awarding you with a tasty 30,000 pesetas, and getting you his fake eyeball to be used on the retinal scanner. Damn, it feels good to be a gangster. After entering through the door, the next major area looms ominously just ahead, though there's still a short but perilous distance to go. Very cool wee quirk with this section with the car is that normally, just as you walk past it, a small mob of Ganados spawn directly behind you out of the door, but if you turn towards the door and walk backwards, they just won't spawn at all until you take your eyes off the door for one second, then all of a sudden six dudes appear. But as manageable as this particular group is, just ahead, Leon and Ashley get chased by a significantly larger mob and lured straight across the bridge and into a colossal stone structure, marking the end of the village portion of the game and the beginning of the next portion, the castle. RE4 can be divided into three major portions, the village, the castle and the island with each of these larger areas having totally different enemies, very different environments, and even different levels of quality if you ask some people, with a lot of folk considering the island portion to be by far the weakest of the three. Though personally, I've never had a big issue with the island. But that's for later, because we are in the castle, and regardless of your feelings on the late game, the castle is almost entirely awesome. Although the general tone and atmosphere of the village was one of damp, dirt and misery, enhanced even further by their antiquated style of clothing, housing and general way of life, the castle marks a drastic shift in tone. Now, antiquated doesn't even do the surroundings justice, with the castle feeling positively medieval, complete with catapults, cannons, cultists and crossbows. It's still Ganados we're up against here, but a different kind of Ganado, with improved stats, battle cries and even weapons. In fact, the flail-armed cultists are one of the most annoying enemies in the game, with their swing, it's disgustingly difficult to avoid. Furthermore, there's even a couple of new types of Las Plagas, which start to sprout up during the castle portion, those being the Type 2 Plagas, which will straight up bite Leon's dumb head off for an insta-kill if you let them get too close. And then there's the Type 3 ones, which spew damaging acid at you, even detaching from their host to attack you independently. Though fun fact about these wee critters, I'm just full of fun facts. If you don't attack them whilst they're detached, they'll always die after 30 seconds anyway. Thankfully, a flash grenade still takes care of any Las Plagas, regardless of whether they're Type 1, Type 2, Type 3 or even Candle Type 1A. One of the nicest things about entering into the castle is seeing the familiar blue flame of the merchant, who now allows for the purchase of the second of the game's two rifles, the semi-auto rifle. Now, the bolt action rifle definitely has its place, not least of all because of its higher firepower potential, but the single biggest advantage that the semi-auto rifle has over its bolt action rival is that it doesn't require a mini reload in between every single shot. Now, you might think shot speed shouldn't be much of an issue with a rifle, but it really can be when you've got a mob of Ganados bearing down upon you. Also, even though the semi-auto isn't quite as powerful as the bolt action, it's still really powerful, and keep in mind that a major factor in the usefulness of rifles is their guaranteed crit chance for headshots on both Ganados and the Las Plagas. And because critical hits have such crazy high multipliers, you'll be doing mental damage with either rifle, regardless of their firepower stat. Though, there are some enemies which are immune to headshots, like the Skull Helmet Monks right here in the castle. And then you have the mini bosses which can't be critted in the same way, like the Bella Sisters and Dr. Salvador. In fact, these two enemies in particular even have caps on the amount of damage you can actually do to them. And so, regardless of the firepower stat of your rifle or magnum, most of that damage gets nullified, 
even with a fully upgraded broken butterfly. Not too sure why they did this really, because I think these two enemy types are the only ones where this is the case, but it's just another interesting wee background quirk. I love that they made the first area of the castle this catapult section, it's just a great introduction to the kind of ridiculousness you should expect from this whole level. Regardless of whether you hit the catapult monks with a rifle shot, an explosion from the red barrels situated next to them, or even a single TMP shot, they will always die in one hit. And furthermore, after you fire the big cannon to blow open the big red door, every enemy in the area instantly just despawns for some reason. There is a big difference in style between the brutal outer sections of the castle and the actual interior though, because once you get through the stark stony exterior, the interior is absolutely extravagant in both colour and style. And speaking of extravagant, this is where everyone's favourite short king gets introduced, Ramon Salazar, so you hear him before you actually see him. <laughs> This laugh creeped the hell out of me when I first heard it. I was afraid to walk further, I thought it was going to be a big scary monster. Salazar is the current castellan of this magnificent piece of architecture and is in close cahoots with Osman Sadler, being a patron and high ranking member of the Los Illuminados, and as such, he is not Leon's friend. There's quite a storied history between the Los Illuminados and the Salazar family too, with Ramon's ancestors having been aware of the Las Plagas wiping out any and all who were infected by it, as well as those who would attempt to push it on others, even sealing away the last Plagas beneath the castle. Then, many generations later, Lord Sadler came into the picture, and Ramon, with his cruel and sadistic tendencies and knowledge of his family's past sins, gave the Los Illuminados access to the Las Plagas once again, and thus, various plans and preparations were set into motion, leading to Ashley's kidnapping and the current state of affairs. For as unpleasant a person as Ramon is, he's a fantastic and somewhat hilarious villain, constantly concocting evil traps and schemes, and frequently calling up Leon on the radio to take the piss with his delightfully shite banter. He's really damn entertaining and even cartoonish, especially with his bizarre clothing and the fact that, you know, come on. As funny as Ramon is though, and as frankly stunning as many sections of the castle certainly are, there's a lot of dark and disturbing aspects to it also. I mean, obviously there are cultist ganados everywhere, so that's pretty grim, although something that certainly lightens the mood a decent bit is the fact that you can now perform suplexes. This isn't actually a new skill that Leon learns or anything, it's just dependent on the enemy type. For villagers on their knees, you have a rather underwhelming back kick, whereas for cultists and soldiers specifically, you've got the suplex, which is one, way cooler looking, and two, way more effective thanks to its inherent 50% crit chance, and there are few things more satisfying than bursting a Ganado's head open with the suplex, especially seeing as how it also kills any parasites inside. Also, despite what you might initially assume, the suplex is equally as effective in terms of damage on the skull helmet cultists, it just doesn't burst their head open. Just as the three main portions of the game all have their own distinctive ganados, the same is true of the mini bosses, and whereas the village had Dr Salvador and the Bella sisters, the main repeating mini boss for the castle is the Garador. As outlandish as this enemy's design is, with the claws and such, it's also pretty fucked up, having had its eyes sewn shut presumably some sort of vile punishment followed by a forcible administration of the Las Plagas parasite across its back, and this is one of the only enemies where its parasite is constantly exposed. Once you get past how intimidating the Garadors look though, they're pretty easy to deal with, as long as you simply walk around so it can't detect your location with its hearing, and due to how often they abruptly change directions, it can be surprisingly easy to just chain rifle or magnum shots to their weak spot, even without the aid of the two bells either side here. Funnily enough though, during the one and only other time I attempted a playthrough on pro difficulty, this was as far as I got before somehow running out of ammo. As such, I came into this expecting ammo to be really scarce again, but surprisingly I never came remotely close to running low. I think the real issue was that I was just really really shitty at the game when I was younger, whereas now my skills are up there with the best. Possibly the single most notorious section of the game actually takes place pretty early on in the castle, and of course, I am talking about the water hall, made even more difficult on pro thanks to the extra enemies, especially the two crossbow cultists at the balconies. 
This part really does overwhelm you as soon as you walk in with the number of enemies directly ahead and the ones who immediately attempt to flank you from either side. It's designed to make you stop and think, what the fuck do I do here, where do I go? Because nowhere in sight is safe, and the presence and vulnerability of Ashley makes all this that much harder. A classic strat is to run down the steps and hide out in the room below and let the Ganados come to you, though this is also kind of boring. That really is an important aspect of survival in RE4 though, getting situated in spots where you cannot be flanked. Even if you find yourself getting cornered, most of the time it's not a problem due to how easily enemies can get stunned and thanks to the awesome knockback of the shotgun, not to mention your flash, incendiary and hand grenades. Crowd control is so manageable here that I relished opportunities to take down hordes of tightly packed enemies, knocking them all back and popping a few heads with a blast from the shotgun. Then you have the water hall, and here, at least in this more open section, you can't really get comfortably situated, but hey, that's just all part of the challenge, isn't it? The second part's good fun though, and the game makes great use of Ashley too. As vulnerable as she is, she's really not useless and does help out on a bunch of occasions, though I still don't understand why she's incapable of climbing down ladders. Hey, what are you looking at? Oh, that's why. Unfortunately, Leon loses Ashley for the first but not last time to the classic rotating wall trap, no less, and so he's back on his lonesome for a bit, and in fact, the Ashley portions only really make up a minority of the game. Yet another new enemy type is introduced just ahead in the sewers, the Nevistadors, which means no sight or unseen. I really like all these Spanish names for enemies because for many years I just had no idea what these words meant, and that somehow made them cooler. In fact, even now I'm not certain about their meanings, I'm just placing blind faith in Google. Unseen is a more accurate term for them compared to no sight though because they rely on camouflage, though if you look closely you can still tell where their heads are by the gross slime coming out of their mouths, and this is very useful because a rifle headshot on these pests is a guaranteed instant kill, whereas they can take a ton of rounds from a handgun, shotgun or TMP. Very creepy area down here in the sewers, especially with that unsettling music which accompanies the presence of an Avistador, though a unique feature I love about this enemy type is that they will nearly always drop one of three types of treasure, either a red, green or blue eye in order of rarity, with these being used to complete the butterfly lamp treasure, though if you're really unlucky, you can go an entire playthrough without a single blue eye dropping. The next several rooms are essentially more outrageous challenges with a fuck ton of cultists wielding various outrageous weaponry, including a goddamn Gatling gun in one case. And as is the theme throughout the castle, Salazar will turn up in calls or in the flesh to taunt Leon, always flanked by his two loyal servants, one clad in a red robe and the other in black, and while they only appear in cutscenes for now, we'll be seeing a good bit more of them later on. Regarding these creatures, there's a memo you can pick up in the castle written by Salazar's butler, lamenting the influence that Lord Sadler has had on the young lord. It even says that Salazar would never have carried out all this business with the Las Plagas unless he was being used unknowingly, and it kinda makes you wonder how he was as a person before taking on the parasite, though judging by some of the insane rooms around the castle, it's heavily implied that he was always a bit rotten. Anyway, regarding the butler, although you never explicitly see him, I've always thought his identity was one of the two Verdugos here. It just seems like a really cool, subtle sub-story, where his butler was so dedicated to the Salazar family that he even agreed to be transformed into one of these dark figures. Though I guess there isn't really any solid evidence for this theory, still, it's a cool idea and I'm sticking with it. The maze section in the courtyard is another notorious part of the game. But as I mentioned before, this part is completely skipped if playing on easy mode, and so as a teenager I must have played through RE4 about 5 times before realising that the maze was an actual section you could play through, rather than something you just merely walk by. There are cute dogs here and everything. Jesus. There are fucking tons of these mangy mutts throughout the maze on pro difficulty, and I've always found this to be one of the scariest parts of the game, because while your visibility is heavily limited thanks to the hedges, you can still hear the dogs growling and running around in the maze, creating a constant sense of tension, though turns out you can insta-kill these enemies with a flash grenade once their parasites are exposed. After the maze, Leon has a surprise encounter with an old ally, Ada Wong, though I'm not sure what she was trying to achieve here by putting a gun to Leon's back. Ada doesn't really provide a good answer as to why she's here at this point, but the name Wesker does get mentioned, and while he doesn't make an appearance at all in the main campaign, he's far more present in separate ways, 
being the behind the scenes architect of several key events in the story. I know there was a lot of controversy surrounding the depiction of Ada in the remake, and while I'm certainly not going to get into all that nonsense, I'll just say that I love her in this game. Great character, great voice acting, and great other stuff too. Remember I said that although they look threatening as hell, that Garadors are actually pretty damn easy to beat? Well, that assessment of the threat level kind of breaks down when you're placed in a small cage with one, because then it gets a bit harder, though once you break out of the cage, it's all good in the hood. A bit ahead, Leon runs into Lewis yet again, who's holding an ambiguous blue sample of something too, but unfortunately this is the last time we see Lewis alive, as Sadler absolutely nails him from behind with his penis. Though before he passes away, he does succeed in giving Leon some medication to suppress, but not halt, the advancement of the last Plagueis in his body. See, although Lewis gives Leon some nonsense story about being a cop in Madrid back when we first met him, in reality, he was a researcher for Lord Sadler, and as such is partially responsible for much of the damage done by Los Illuminados, having found himself too fascinated by the unique properties of the parasite to tear himself away from his research. Eventually, however, Lewis had a crisis of conscience as he became fully aware of Sadler's true plans, and so betrayed Sadler, removing the last Plagueis from his own body and devising a way for others to do the same, so long as the parasite has not yet reached full maturity. Thus, while there's still hope for Leon and Ashley to be cured, the Ganados we see throughout the game are much too far gone, though I guess that was already pretty obvious. The glass container carried by Lewis here was in fact a special sample of the last Plagueis, intended to be used as a bargaining chip for Ada, so that they'd help him escape Sadler's clutches before destroying him and his cult, though I'm not too sure why he proudly displays the sample to Leon here, because he has no knowledge of any of this. Unfortunately, the deal never got made because Sadler found out what Lewis was up to, hence why he had him tied up in the closet earlier, and why he just brutally impaled him with some ambiguous tentacle. A somewhat strange aspect to all this is that it turns out Ashley was in the same room the whole time, as revealed by her obnoxious cries for help. If you want to play it safe here, you can use a rifle to shoot away the three bars holding her in place, or if you're a pro like me, ditch the rifle and bring out the TMP. This can backfire. In fact, if you hit Ashley with literally anything at any point in the game, it's instant death. And if you ever thought it's slightly odd the way Leon goes, <laughs> When Ashley dies, it's because they just reused that line from the optional cutscene way back at the beginning if you look at the car wreck near the busted bridge. Oh, no. The section which follows is an interesting one, because it's the one and only time in the game where you directly control Ashley, and the only time where you can't use weapons or even a knife, though there are still the lanterns to be thrown at the two cultists here. The Ashway section really is a nice wee change in pace with its focus on navigation and avoidance of danger, though the sliding tile puzzle can certainly cause headaches. The funny thing about this puzzle is that it's mostly already done for you to start with. All you need to do is slot the left hand piece into the middle, and then rotate the outer pieces clockwise by a couple of tiles and it's finished, but unless you know this beforehand, you can really fuck yourself here. I remember getting so frustrated on my first playthrough when I was younger. Because I'm horrendous at puzzles like this, and I think I nearly gave up with the game before eventually managing it. Still way better than the power calibration puzzles from the remake though, I hated those. Eventually, after running in terror from these armoured knights, and this part truly is terrifying, Ashway and Leon are reunited, at least for now. She gets taken away again about a half hour after this. Honestly, all the remaining chapters left for the castle just get crazier and crazier. First, you've got a magma room filled with fire-breathing gargoyle statues, then you're attacked by sets of parasite-controlled living armours, and then there's the collapsing ceiling, a double Garador fight, a double El Gigante fight, a fucking minecart section, you get chased by a massive statue of Salazar, the boss fight against the Verdugo, then a perilous climb up a circular tower whilst exploding barrels are being rolled down at you. See, that's the thing about RE4, it's full of highlights, there are almost no bland transitional areas or forgettable rooms with no real purpose, instead, nearly every room is highly memorable for one reason or another. Before I started writing this retrospective, it was not at all my intention to provide commentary on so many sections and rooms, but there's just too many interesting high quality parts of the game. I mean, 
even just this weird platform. Its only purpose is to take Leon from one side of the room to the other, over the magma, and yet look at it. They didn't need to make it look so damn gnarly, but they did, and as a result, when I think of RE4, this is one of the rooms I think of. From beginning to end, the castle is an absolute spectacle. There's just so much fun shit packed in here. And speaking of fun, this was around about the point that I decided to pick up the Mind Thrower, because I love the Mind Thrower. A lot of people sleep on it, because it kind of sounds lame, plus you only have so much space in your inventory. And by this point, I imagine most folk will have some type of handgun, shotgun, rifle, maybe a TMP, and maybe a magnum, and so a sixth additional weapon really is a bit overkill. But nonetheless, I always pick up the mind thrower. Though a word of warning, don't use it when Ashley's close by. Speaking of inventory management, it truly is one of the unexpected hidden pleasures of RE4. Of course, you can't just pick stuff up and have it automatically crammed anywhere in your attaché case, because there was no auto sort back in the original game, but I love occasionally taking a minute or two to organise everything systematically. Grenades to the top right, ammo aligned next to its respective firearm, and healing items at the bottom right. My system is very important to me. Like I said, even though Ashway is not long back with us, just a bit ahead, she gets carried off once again by an Avistador, complete with a massive gross nest, hive thing. Again, very common knowledge to most folk who know the game, but the hive can be shot down. And this was another thing I did not discover until several playthroughs in. And you can even shoot it down before entering the room, getting you a ton of green and red eyes, and perhaps even a rare blue or two if you're lucky. Though we fought Navistadors before, the ones which appear here are a different variant, not having any camouflage abilities, but being able to fly. Of the two variants, I know which one I prefer, and it's these ones, because shooting them whilst they're flying is a guaranteed crit having a 50% chance to do either 18 times damage or 25 times, either of which are crazy. As such, I love going wild with a TMP here, same for the much harder on the Vistador section later on, though if you kill one while they're flying over the edge of a ledge, you miss out on that precious treasure. Also, on an unrelated note, this is of course the HD version I'm playing, which looks incredible might I say. But although they remastered almost every cutscene in the main campaign, there's one that they somehow missed. I mean, it literally is the single most unexciting cutscene in the game, so I guess they either thought no one would give a shit if they left it as it was, or they just forgot about it. After crossing the bridge, with the help of the mind thrower of course, you're greeted by two Garadors at the end of the hall, so if you happen to be playing on easy mode, only one will appear here. These two aren't identical either, as the one to the right has extra armour, and is the only one of its kind in the game, and not only that, but the armoured one in particular is one of the very few enemies in the game which can survive a rocket launcher blast, at least on pro difficulty. Beyond the twin Garadors, they're once again reunited with Ashley, but also Salazar and his butlers, if you buy my theory. It's another QTE, but I guess I got a bit morbid while playing, so I decided to just not push any buttons here to see what happens. Yeah, it turns out that's what happens. This part down at the bottom of the spike pit is yet another important moment for our firepower capabilities, because it's where the third and final of the game's three shotguns becomes available for purchase. The Striker, without a doubt the best shotgun in the game, with the highest damage output per second and a ridiculously high ammo capacity, especially if you get its exclusive upgrade. The Striker's only downside compared to the others is that it doesn't have great ranged damage, whereas both the regular shotgun and riot gun can still do great damage even to fairly distant enemies, though the range for delivering that signature shotgun knockback is identical for all three shotguns. Six and a half in-game meters to be precise. Now comes the next major boss fight, though interestingly it's kind of optional, just like the second El Gigante fight. It is of course Salazar's right hand, Verdugo, which directly translates to Executioner. Sick. The Verdugo hunts you down within these tunnels, attacking you at random, testing your reaction time with QTEs before dropping down entirely after the power is turned on for the elevator, and thus begins the actual boss fight. Now, while I didn't at all see the point in trying to escape the second El Gigante fight, I can 100% understand why you'd want to escape from this fight, and in fact, I'd even go so far as to recommend it for the simple fact 
the reward is shit. All you get is the crown jewel, which is worth just 11,000 pesetas. Yes, you can combine it with the crown, along with the royal insignia, but even then the complete crown goes for 48,000 bucks, whereas I think it would be more appropriate to get 50,000 for the Verdugo fight alone. To tell you the truth, I used to not even know that the Verdugo could be killed at all on my first few playthroughs. I thought the Liquid Nitrogen was just here to slow it down, but no, they are required to deal full damage to the boss. It can still be damaged even when not frozen, but it takes 66% less damage, making it even more of a bullet sponge. Despite the fact that there is clearly boxes and boxes of ammunition laid out on the merchant's stall at various points in the game, you can't buy ammo, but even so, it still has great value, and so sometimes you've got to weigh up whether or not it's worth taking down certain tanky enemies. Thankfully, the game will adjust the frequency of ammo drops from enemies depending on your currently held stockpile of particular ammo types. Some drops out in the world are fixed, but most enemy drops are not, so if you've got above 70 handgun ammo, 200 TMP ammo, or 25 shotgun ammo, enemies will literally never drop those respective ammo types, whereas if you're low on a specific type of ammo, the game's usually not long in giving you some more. It's a nice wee system. The next area mixes things up quite a bit, and it's always really refreshing to come down here, in the mines, the very place where the last Plagueis was sealed away before being unearthed by prospecting villagers who inhaled the parasitic spores before later transforming into the violent bioweapons we see everywhere. The reason it's so refreshing is that you're back fighting villagers, including a few reappearances of Senor Salvador, though he's a wee bit confused. Well, that's him taken care of. Fuck. Very fun general area though, and I even found a treasure that I did not know existed. I've never seen this thing before. There's a fight with a pair of El Gigantes in one of the coolest rooms in the game. It looks very hot, but it's the third time these big lads have popped up, and their attacks are all the same. And you can even go on to fight another El Gigante later in separate ways. And saying that, it's always fun to drop one of them in the magma, though I was shitting myself that it would come back up and grab Leon for an insta-kill. That can happen by the way but either it didn't trigger here or I somehow missed it. Maybe it only happens if you get too close. The absolute cherry on top of the whole level is of course the minecart section. It's so fun and once again the TMP comes in super handy because if an enemy is standing close to any edge, just one hit from anything will knock them down. And so just like how you can trivialise the wee lift section back in the village, the same can be done here. And even the Dr Salvadors who brought down can be insta-killed if you hit them fast enough though then you miss out on that sweet loot. The jump at the end kind of makes me laugh though, because they use this nearly identical animation at the very next section, and there are only two times it's used in the whole game, yet it appears back to back. Seriously though, of any room or general section of the castle, I think the one which typifies it most is the giant Salazar statue. It's so weird and dumb and pointless. Like, why is there a massive moving statue of Salazar here? And why does it dance like an Egyptian? And why does it start running after Leon like a robot? Do you know why? It's because it's fucking fun, that's why. Also, never noticed this before, but the statue's mouth also opens and closes as it runs. Cool wee detail. But all this traversal through these weird and wonderful environments and contraptions gets closer and closer to the enormous circular tower where Ashley is supposedly being held, and where Salazar awaits. This tower happened to be one of the hardest parts of the remake for me, but it's very tough here too, and again, sections like these are where you really notice those extra enemies thrown at you because of the pro difficulty. By far, the biggest pain in my ass throughout this entire run though was the crossbow ganados, and this was never really the case in all my normal playthroughs, but at higher difficulties, not only are there more of them, but they're way more accurate, and even just having two of them firing at you at once like in the waterhole, can be very difficult to deal with. There's nothing more irritating than aiming at one with a rifle before being hit by the other, and then you aim at the other and then the first one hits you, and so on and so forth. At the top of the tower, I got a really creepy bug that I'd never had before, but I kept hearing the deep chanting of a cultist as if it were right beside me, even though there was no one here. I guess one got stuck in a wall somewhere. 
and then it stopped and I thought it fixed itself before just continuing on again. Random bugs like these always scare me. It puts me in mind of one I experienced years ago when playing Fallout 3, where some enemy or texture got all fucked up and stretchy and literally never left me alone, as in it just followed me around forever, so that I had to either start a fresh playthrough or live with it. I started a fresh playthrough. Within the top of the tower awaits Salazar and the remaining Verdugo, but no Ashley. He mentions that the ritual has been complete, that being the ceremony officially inducting her into the Los Illuminados, but interestingly enough, there are actually no details about what the ritual entails. Of course, you get to see it in all its grisly glory in the remake, but here in the original, you've just got to use your imagination. Presumably it's got something to do with infecting her even further with the last Plagueis or speeding up the process, but even so, she still doesn't become fully infected after this. You see her again later on, and she's pretty much fine. My guess, it's clear by this point that there are different types of Las Plagas which affect people differently. I compare Chief Mendez and Salazar to this farmer's wife. They have quite different levels of intelligence and strength. Ashway has been spirited away to the island, a different area entirely, and one which is very different to both the village and the castle, but for now, we've got Salazar to take on, who, along with his Verdugo, becomes part of the massive organic growth behind him. Now, I have a bit of a history with this boss, because this was usually where I'd buy a rocket launcher to hit its weak point for a one hit kill. When I first played the game, I was intimidated as fuck by Salazar and kept getting nailed by his insta kill bite attack, so I just said screw it and cheesed my way through it. It's weird because on subsequent playthroughs, this just became routine for me. I was like, okay here's Salazar, time for the rocket launcher. Then, many playthroughs later, I realised I'd never actually fought the boss normally, and I didn't even know its mechanics. Turns out it's really not that difficult, you just need to hit its eye to expose the weak point inside the shell, and then fire at Salazar with a magnum or rifle, watching out for the tentacles at either side. Also apparently you can even stun the tentacles, though I've never tried this myself. After enough damage has been dealt, Salazar goes down, accompanied by a particularly gross, messy death animation too. Thus, Leon's next objective is to reach the island where Ashley has been taken, and so that means descending back down the tower for some means of transport there. After seeing this animation of Leon abseiling down the rope, it made me wonder if there was a separate animation for him climbing back up, because I just never tried it. Turns out there is, and it looks like this. Wow. At the end of the tunnel at the bottom of the castle, Ada once again appears, offering passage to the island via a boat, but once again offering nothing in the way of answers regarding why she's here or why she's even helping Leon. And so ends the castle portion of the game, kicking off the third and final portion, the island, the most controversial section of RE4. In fact, I've had a surprising number of people who straight up think that the game gets bad here and stop enjoying it anywhere near as much. Me myself personally, while I would say that the island is the weakest part of the game, I don't think it's bad at all. I was pretty surprised when I realised the extent to which people disliked it. There are a ton of new enemies, several iconic sections, the knife fight scene, and Mike. Well, I will say that the game bails up the bullshit a wee bit here, especially towards the end. Throughout most of this playthrough I died here and there a wee bit, but once I reached the island, I died quite a lot, especially in the last couple of sections where the game goes balls to the wall action with miniguns and attack helicopters, a far cry from the sombre horror of the village or the medieval mayhem of the castle. The intensity really is kicked off right away too, as you get absolutely swarmed by these new island ganados about 30 seconds after setting foot on the place, and I ate it three times on this first part alone, in no small part due to the introduction of a new mini boss, because instead of Dr. Salvador's or Garador's, we had this Saddam Hussein looking motherfucker, although his in game name is JJ, being one of the very few examples of a ganado using a gun, and a big one too. Also, just like the armoured Garador from earlier on in the castle, JJ is one of the few enemies who can survive a direct rocket launcher hit, so my favourite way to take these dudes out is with a rifle or magnum. There are only two magnums in the game, with the broken butterfly being the first one available, followed by the Killer 7, which is based off of KD Smith's weapon from one of my all time favourite games, Killer 7, also directed by the great Shinji Mikami. As expected, magnums can get disgustingly powerful, particularly the broken butterfly if you buy its exclusive upgrade, bringing its firepower stat all the way to 50, making it 40% stronger than even a maxed out killer 7. 
You also get a fun wee bit of unique merchant dialogue upon buying the broken butterfly, and here it is. What? Oh, fuck's sake, I skipped it. Whoops. Ah oh, yes, here it is. I see you have an eye for things. Guns not just about shooting, it's about reloading. You'll know what I'm talking about. There is also the hand cannon, I guess, which is literally described as a magnum, but you can't unlock that solely by playing the main campaign, and despite being a magnum, it doesn't actually use magnum ammo, and so I consider it its own unique class of weapon. The sense of progression from the start of the game to the end is very well done, and it makes me wonder how much less fun the game might be if there wasn't a currency and you couldn't upgrade your equipment because a big part of the fun of the game is starting out with basic weapons with low stats and gradually upgrading them, getting stronger with each chapter and building your arsenal with different weapon types and accumulating ammo. Although it's a completely different type of game, it's kind of the same sort of enjoyment I get when playing Dark Souls, where you start off weak as hell before finding better equipment and levelling up your stats. It's the same sort of thing. Or maybe I just can't go even one video without making a Dark Souls reference. After working through the outside section of the island, we can enter inside the main facility, and while everything in it is very much in line with modern day technology compared to the environments we've seen before, it's still all dirty and rotten. Especially the kitchen where you can even see huge maggots devouring unrefrigerated meat, though as ever Leon has some weird observation about it. Imagine seeing a rotting, writhing hunk of beef hanging from a hook in a filthy kitchen and thinking, ah, this puts me right in the mood of a steak. Anyway, let's continue onwards and yeah. It's not too long before we get our first sign of Ashley here, hearing her voice coming through from a security feed, leading to a slightly sinister cutscene. Apparently, this scene was removed from the German version of the game back on the GameCube and or PS2 version, because they thought it was a bit too uncomfortably suggestive. Or at least, I remember reading that in some gaming magazine about 12 years ago. Not sure it's actually true, because I couldn't find anything online about it, but look, it's what the magazine said. And thus, we've got to reach the room where Ashway is being kept and get the key card to open it. The next section features one of the most well-known enemies from RE4, and by far the scariest enemy in the game, which is really great, because up until this point, the island has largely been action-focused, throwing hordes of ganados at you, and even a fucking dude with a minigun, but now the regenerator is introduced, which translates to regenerator. Terrifying enemy, and these things straight up cause me anxiety as a teenager, especially seen as how after this particular one wakes up, several other regenerators start roaming around outside. And while you don't see them at first, you hear them. Of course, while you can kill them now, it's really not advisable due to how tanky they can be, hence the whole regeneration aspect. Though incendiary grenades work surprisingly well, but the infrared scope is the best way to handle them, revealing the Las Plagas attached to their bodies, acting as weak spots. Though an interesting thing about these weak spots is that without the infrared scope, they effectively do not exist, and that it's impossible to hit one of them without the scope, even if you try spraying them with a TMP, or you shoot the exact spot where the parasite should be after confirming its location with the scope. Regenerators are also one of the few enemies who somehow become more dangerous after damaging their legs, and this really sucks because on pro difficulty, they'll pretty much always have an additional parasite on their back, meaning you need to knock them down to get a clear shot at it. And then you have the Iron Maidens, even buffer versions of the Regenerators, and with one of the most terrifying attacks of any game. <laughs> The design for these things really is crazy, because as horrific as the regular variants are, they still have something resembling a face, but the Iron Maidens just have a big fucked up mouth. Thank Christ there's only three of them in the whole game. Eventually, after a whole lot of fanning around with key cards, we can free Ashley from her cell, making this the third time Leon has rescued her, though it still won't be the last. As indicated, within a sexy note, from everyone's favourite femme fatale, the nearby garbage chute leads to the way out, though if you ask me this leap seems a bit reckless. The next sections really play a large part in making the island still a great part of the game, even if it is a bit weak in comparison to the village and the castle, because come on, who could forget the wrecking ball bit, or the bulldozer section? I mean, not all of the island is this distinctive, because some parts do kind of blend into another, especially when you're running around the interior trying to find key cards and stuff. But there are definite highlights here too, and again, 
The game gets really hard, especially when you've also got to keep an eye on Ashley. I thought I'd be clever in the wrecking ball room and leave her up there on the ledge and out of harm's way, but then some Ganados just climbed up there anyway and carried her off to the nearby door. Also, I tried standing directly in front of the swinging ball to see what would happen, but it turns out it doesn't actually have any collision. Disappointing. At the end of the frankly awesome bulldozer section, and after getting nailed by the truck, Leon and Ashley wake up in a... Uh... You know, sometimes I don't know who the scariest monster in the game is. The Iron Maiden or Ashley? Yet again, for the last time at least, Ashley is kidnapped back into the hands of Sadler, though this time he does it by directly controlling the maturing Las Plagas inside her body, indicating that it's not long before they've fully matured and she's beyond help, and Sadler's method of controlling those infected with the Las Plagas is via sound waves emitted from his staff, ones that only the parasites can detect. Yet again, Sadler lets Leon live here for who knows what reason, however, a new antagonist also enters the picture at this point, Krauser. We see both Krauser and Ada conversing at some ambiguous location on the island, and indeed, both are working for Wesker, though it'd be a bit of a stretch to call them allies. Krauser was the one who originally kidnapped Ashley so as to buy the trust of Sadler, also he could get that special sample of the last Plagas to take back to Wesker except Sadler knew from the start that Krauser was full of shit, and thus, Ada had to be called in to finish the job, arranging a deal with Lewis, who even managed to smuggle out a sample before his ploy was foiled by Sadler. And so, at this point, Krauser's task is to hunt down Leon, who is causing too much trouble for Wesker at this point. But just as Leon and Ada had a history, so too do Leon and Krauser, though that history wouldn't be fully depicted until Resident Evil The Dark Side Chronicles in 2009. Leon and Krauser's first confrontation comes quite soon after, too, in the legendary knife fight. As easy as the QTEs are in RE4, and even though there are only two possible button combinations, I still remember dying here a bunch when I was younger, and so in the spirit of that, I decided to let Leon die at every possible opportunity just to see all the different death animations. For fun. Isn't that fun? Of course, the fight gets broken up at the last minute by Ada, though the Krauser boss fight does appear just a bit ahead, but not before a different boss entirely, one that was totally cut from the remake too, it's U3. The fight consists of two main phases, with it being impossible to actually kill U3 in phase 1 whilst making your way from one floating platform to the next, though it will leave temporarily if you deal enough damage. Even though the main objective in phase 1 is to simply escape it, I actually prefer it to phase 2, where the objective is to kill it. It's not a bad boss or anything, but there's something about it that I've always found just a bit underwhelming. I'm really not a fan of the attack where it digs down into the ground, because I can use it a lot and there's really nothing you can do to counter it, other than wait for the simple button prompt to appear to dodge its surprise attack. I've always considered this the perfect boss to use magnums on too, and it's one of the fights I specifically save up my magnum bullets for because of how damn tanky it is, but in reality, this is completely the wrong move, because for whatever reason, magnum shots do 50% less damage to U3, and so rifles are probably the best choice here, though by this point, you can even be doing crazy damage output with a Red 9 if you've bought the exclusive upgrade for it. There's barely any distance between the U3 fight and the next boss fight, with Krauser lying in wait within some sandstone ruins ahead. Although most of the game's boss fights do feel distinctive from each other with their own unique quirks and mechanics, Krauser is by far the most unique, because in a way, the entire arena is the boss. He'll ambush Leon at various points around the ruins with his dexterous dashes, flips and knife slashes, though he'll also bust out the explosive crossbow, chuck grenades and even use unique technology in the form of these weird drone type things, not found anywhere else in the game. As I mentioned previously when discussing the Mendez fight, certain bosses have significant weaknesses. For the big cheese, it was incendiary grenades, trivialising that whole encounter and saving you loads of ammo. And for as challenging as Krauser can certainly be, he also has an unlikely yet significant weakness, and that's the knife, which does 17.5 times more damage than normal when it's Krauser who's on the receiving end, and that applies to every time he attacks Leon throughout the ruins and on the rooftop at the end when he reveals his secret weapon in the form of his mutated bladed arm. 
Thus, we see that despite Sadler not trusting Krauser, he still gifted him with a dose of the Wasp Plagueis, a gift which Krauser eagerly accepted, seeing the potential for superhuman power, though at the expense of some of his humanity. Despite this secret weapon, the final confrontation with Krauser on the rooftop can be ended in about 25 seconds, with good positioning and effective use of the knife, resulting in the apparent death of Leon's former comrade. However, although he does look pretty freaking dead here, he's not, going on to attack Ada after this encounter in separate ways, though it's obvious they either didn't or couldn't get the original voice actor back because he has no new lines of dialogue here. It's like the Dark Aeon fights from FF10, where they just recycled earlier lines for the intro cutscenes. As far as the main campaign is concerned though, Krauser is finished, though sadly this is the only boss in the game where you don't get any money or treasure for victory. After the boss, the game completely throws any semblance of horror out the window, and just goes full fucking action movie, with more ganados than at any other point, spilling forth from everywhere. And as well as the inclusion of JJ, who's armed with his signature minigun, there are Ganados situated on mounted Gatling guns, and as well as this, we have Big Mike, who arrives in the nick of time in an attack helicopter. I love Mike's introduction here, just how casually he flies in and makes his dumb joke. It's about time. Sorry, bad traffic. I'll cover you. Seriously though, this entire section fucking sucks, as in it's really really hard. Before this, the only ranged attacks you need to deal with are from crossbows and hatchets, and yes, they can certainly be difficult to avoid in hectic situations, but they're well telegraphed and can even be shot or slashed out of the air. Unfortunately, the same cannot be said for bullets, particularly when you have multiple Gatling guns firing at you at once. This whole part really is quite messy, but at the same time it's the end of the game. It's all leading towards the big climax with Sadler, you've been buying guns and upgrading them and saving up grenades and magnum ammo and such, and so this is the time to really be using all that stuff and blasting everything away, and kicking JJ in the face from a zipline. Sadly, regrettably, Mike gets shot down out of the sky, swatted out of existence like a fly from Brooklyn. Insects life doesn't compare to human lives. Oh, sorry. Shortly after, Leon once again encounters Ada, but despite the medication given to him by Lewis earlier, the Las Plagas is taking its toll, and beginning to take hold as he loses control and attacks Ada, and Capcom would go on to include a very similar scene many years later in The Evil Within. Very underrated game by the way. After all the explosive action, Leon comes across Ashley for her final rescue, breaking her out of the pod she's being held in, and escaping from Sadler with the help of Ada. Most of the Separate Ways campaign is just recycled content from the main campaign, though certainly with a lot of new dialogue and extra story details that are not fleshed out with Leon's campaign, but she does get a unique boss fight with Sadler here, which is pretty cool, even if he's not exactly the most interesting boss in the game. Lying inexplicably close to where Ashley was just being held happens to be the machine specifically designed by Lewis for destroying Las Plagas within people's bodies with the help of electromagnetic radiation, though it's supposed to be a very painful procedure, and even potentially deadly if the parasite has fully matured. Despite that, both Leon and then Ashley are fully cured after about 10 seconds each in the machine, and that's that, they're all good now, sweet. Perfect. Another good job well done. In the immortal words of Leon, I have no idea how this thing works. The important thing is that we're alive. Well said, Leon. Well said. 
And folks, we are now on the final chapter. All that remains is to take out the dreadful mastermind behind the Los Illuminados, Lord Sadler, before making our daring escape off this dark island forever. Here's me going through my final inventory sorting process, and as you can see, I ended with a very comfortable amount of ammo, even from a magnum. Though the nice thing about RE4 is that even if you do hoard magnum ammo and such till the end, it's not entirely wasted, because you can simply bring it over onto a New Game Plus playthrough. New Game Plus is great fun, and I've done runs of it many times, but unlike games like Dark Souls, it doesn't actually get any more difficult from one New Game Plus to the next. And so you can completely trivialise the early game ganados and bosses with your fully upgraded arsenal. Still good fun though. After leaving Ashley behind in a safe place, Leon takes an elevator higher up to where Ada is bound while Sadler awaits with his grotesque living staff, though his old trick of incapacitating Leon no longer works thanks to the procedure he just underwent, and so after cutting Ada down from captivity, the only thing left to do is to put an end to Sadler once and for all. Good god, he is one ugly son of a bitch. Sadler has the highest amount of health of any enemy in the game, and the fact that his mouth eye weak spot is concealed for most of the fight makes it seem even higher, because while he does take damage from hits elsewhere on his body, he'll take 80% less damage. The saving grace in this fight is the special rocket launcher thrown down by Ada when Sadler gets to 50% HP, and of course, you play this part out in separate ways in a time based section. It is entirely possible to beat Sadler even without the rocket launcher, and you also get a slightly different death cutscene which most folk will never see, but fuck that, I want to hit something big with a rocket launcher, please. With Sadler dead, the last Plagueis sample rolls to the floor, which Leon picks up, but unfortunately, Ada shows her true colours and takes it from him. The retrieval of the sample was her main mission here in the first place after all. In any case, Leon's only mission was to rescue the President's daughter and bring her back, and thanks to the jet ski keys provided by Ada, the pair make the dramatic escape, dodging falling rocks and explosions before storming out of the cave and into the cleansing sunlight. <sighs> I love this game. Let's go home. Sounds like a great idea. Mission accomplished. Right, Leon? Not quite. I still have to get you home safe. So, uh, after you take me back to my place, how about we do some, um, overtime? <laughs> Sorry. Somehow I knew you'd say that, but it doesn't hurt to ask, you know? So, who was that woman, anyway? Why do you ask? Come on, tell me. She's like a part of me I can't let go. Let's leave it at that. The end credits are actually well worth watching too, because the artwork here depicts what life used to be like in the village, showing happy people working the farm dining with her families and frolicking with her children before the Los Illuminados came and changed everything. These images really are superb and quite disturbing, especially this one and then the one afterwards showing what might have been one of the first emergences of a parasite coming out of someone's neck. An area where RE4 also excelled was with all the bonus content unlocked after completing the main game. On the GameCube version, you unlocked a Simon Ada and the Mercenaries, though for the PS2 version, as well as on every other version of the game, they added in separate ways too, a shorter campaign from the perspective of Ada Wong. A Simon Ada confused me quite a bit when I first played it, because I couldn't figure out where it was supposed to sit in the story. So you play as Ada, who infiltrates the island, with the task being to collect 5 Las Plagas samples for Wesker, with a fight against Krauser at the end. There's really not anything new here during this mission and you can zip through it pretty fast, and turns out it's entirely non-canonical to the actual RE4 story, so really not that much to talk about here. Separate Ways, on the other hand, is a much bigger deal, with far greater significance to the main story, giving you a clearer understanding of what the hell Ada was up to throughout Leon's whole escapade. 
and even revealing that she was the one behind the church bell ringing at the end of the village holdout which saved Leon. There are six chapters to separate ways, though as I mentioned earlier it's mostly recycled content, all except for chapter 4, which is an entirely new level. In fact, the extent to which it differs from the rest of the game even feels a bit jarring. And if you thought some of the later parts of the main campaign were rough, that is nothing compared to this part, where you have several automated battleship cannons firing directly at you, whilst you frantically run around looking for colour-coded activation keys whilst trying not to get obliterated by the cannons. I'll be honest, I don't really like this chapter, even if it is unique. In fact, I don't feel all that strongly about separate ways in general. It's a nice compliment to the main campaign, and it'll take a good 3 or 4 hours to finish, but it's certainly not a highlight, and some aspects of it feel a bit sloppy. For example, the merchant shows up in every chapter, except you can't upgrade your stuff. You can buy items, and even treasure maps, and a fantastic explosive bow gun, but there's literally not enough shit to spend your money on here. By the end, I had nearly 85,000 bucks, but nothing to actually buy with it apart from a rifle scope I didn't need. I would argue that the highlight of the post-game content is The Mercenaries, an incredibly fun, score-based challenge letting you play as totally different characters, each with their own weapons, animations and overpowered follow-up melee attacks. My favourite has to be Hunk, because he can do this. As fun as the neckbreaker is, the best place to use it is in the village, because he can insta-kill the Bella sisters for tons of easy points, though let's not forget the awesomeness of Wesker's thrust punch, which is also an insta-kill on regular Ganados, same with Krauser's arm attack. I realise that I described the Iron Maidens as the scariest enemy in the game before, but I should have been more specific. They're the scariest enemy in the campaign, whereas anyone who's played the Waterworld level knows who the true most terrifying enemy is. I'm so glad they kept the Super Salvadors to the mercenaries only, because they are a nightmare to deal with. Speaking of this enemy, I'd highly encourage people to look up an insane RE4 mod called Rising of Evil. It ups the difficulty of the game to utterly excessive levels, often by just cramming multiple Super Salvadors, Garadors and Verdugos into single rooms. I'd recommend watching Box Soup's playthrough of it in particular, it's both hilarious and ridiculous. Resident Evil 4 is the game I have finished more times than any other game, and that's really saying something. It's a fantastic action horror game, but even saying that about it still doesn't feel sufficient, because there's such an outstanding level of polish present in its combat mechanics, its progression system, its level design, and even its graphics, especially for a near 20 year old game. The HD version is stunning, but even back then, on the GameCube and PS2, this was one of the best looking games of that generation. And not just its graphics, but its style. RE4 has so many moments that just stick with you, in fact, most of the game is composed of such moments. Nearly every room, hallway and general level feels lovingly tailored and refined. It's what kept people talking about it for so long, and it's why people still talk about it even after the release of the remake, and it's why even though I've lost count of the number of times I've finished it, I will always return for another playthrough. Because to put it simply, Resident Evil 4 is a good fucking time. Please allow me to give my kind patrons a final thank you, and as always, cheers for watching, and cheerio.